cop and like militant, like going through the line. He looks over at Tiki. He's like, remember Tiki, more points of pressure on that ball now. Got to hold on to it, no turnovers. Eli, Eli, check downs are big, okay? If you don't get it, let's go check down. We'll play the next play. Jesse, you picked Jessica? <laughs> Come on. My next guest on Soup with Coop is multi-talented. He's a football player. He's a broadcaster. He's a foodie. He's a Canadian. Let's see what else. He's a pitch man. He's a reality star, but he's a good friend, a Manning Passing Academy alum, and uh, and he loves soup. So uh, Jesse Palmer, welcome to Soup with Coop. Coop, great seeing you, brother. Thank you so much for having me on this. This is a this is a real treat. A real treat. I, I, I got so excited to have some good soup today. And Soup with Friends is always better. I could, that's probably what we should have called the show. Soup with Friends would be much more uh, appropriate. Tell me about what you're, uh, what, you're, what you're having today. So Texans get really particular about their chili. Mm -hmm. No beans. And I think they also don't believe in tomatoes. This chili is really spicy. It's essentially a meat-based chili. She's slow cooked uh, this meat basically all morning. We have some jalapenos that we grow outside in our, uh, in our garden, which I got a little bit cavalier with, I'll admit, which is why I'm sweating in my chili. But uh, I got to say, pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this. What are you going with? I'm having a chili as well. No beans, because I've got a little trip today to see a JV game with some people. I didn't want to ruin the entire trip, but I'm going to put a little Tabasco to spice it. I'm kind of jealous of your jalapeno. And mm. uh, unfortunately, my uh, wife... Nor, more, nor my wife or fiance has the ability to make soup. So I'm going right out of the can, Hormel, <laughs> old school. But it's actually, uh, it's quite delicious, I must say. It's good, yeah. I don't know how the weather is in New Orleans. I feel like fall's finally starting to break up here in New York. So this chili too, it's kind of, the, it, it's a good time of year. I, you know, your people had asked me to kind of decide on the soup like a week before we did this. And I was like trying to like think of all the soups I love. And as a Canadian, like I love split pea soup. And I'm trying to think of like, I, I almost threw SpaghettiOs at you, but I didn't know if that qualified as soup. See, I, I wasn't sure whether chili qualified as soup. I mean, right. we could probably change the show to chili with Coop and maybe. Yours looks know. soupy. Yeah. Your chili, like, like, I don't know if you can see this, like the consistency, like I'm turning it sideways and it's, oh, I just like spilled it on my mouse pad. <laughs> I'm now gonna have to. Exp I'm now gonna have to explain that. Now, growing up in Canada, did y'all have eat a lot of soup? Yeah, I feel like it's like winter, like ten months of the year. So you're always trying to find excuses to stay warm. So yeah, like split pea, like in Quebec, and we actually grew up very close to Quebec. We we grew up in Ottawa, but split pea soup with like smoked bacon on like cold winter nights it is like one of the great memories I have growing up there. And when you say bacon, was that Canadian bacon? Yeah, otherwise you go to jail. It might be illegal. Yeah, like you can't say like, you can't say like pancetta. This is a nice split pea soup with a smoked pancetta. I don't know any Canadian kid who's like nine years old eating that. How, talk about the football scene in Canada. I'm curious growing up. I had, we had a guy like my junior year coming to New Orleans from Canada, came in in the middle of summer, went out for football, and you know, it's August in New Orleans, and we had, I think we took him to the hospital the first day. He, <laughs> he was sunburned, and then he had heat strokes. I mean, how did the guy from Canada wind up in Florida? But what's the football scene like in Canada? And, yeah, so, and, so, so basically, what you just described about your buddy sounds like my first two-a-day in Gainesville with <laughs> Coach Spurrier, before dry fit was invented, when we were wearing like <laughs> cotton starter t-shirts and full pads for an entire month. Um, the football scene in Canada, there are a lot of football fans. I'd say mostly NFL fans. Everybody has an NFL team, yet nobody has an allegiance or a reason why, because no one's ever really lived in the States. So we have like an inordinate amount of Cowboy fans. Don't get it. Uh, we have a lot of Buffalo Bills fans near where I grew up because that geographically is the closest team to where we're from. We're very proud of our own professional league, the Canadian Football League. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many Americans know or are familiar, but like there, there have been some great NFL quarterbacks, uh, Warren Moon, I should say great, and then I'm going to decategorize it. Warren Moon, Doug Flutie, Jeff Garcia, there have been a lot of guys that have kind of come through the CFL into the NFL. So 
we're proud of that league. The rules are different. Growing up playing high school football, it's popular. We play Canadian rules. Um, but, uh, but as you know, like hockey's the thing. Like that's what every kid grows up wanting to be. And my dad played in the CFL. He was a linebacker and a punter for seven years in the CFL. And so I sort of grew up, I'm sure a little bit, you know, similar and dissimilar to you guys in the Manning family. But like I had a lot of photos of my dad on the wall and his jerseys and stuff. And he was always getting together with his old teammates and buddies. And that was sort of like my upbringing growing up and seeing that. And I think that's kind of what made me want to want to play football. You know, I've looked at some pictures of your dad. He's a handsome guy. He has a mustache a lot of times too, which I really like. But you don't you don't hear about a linebacker slash punter as much as you used to. He's a legend, and he yeah. has a great he has a great name. So his his name is William Palmer, but his his football nickname was Dollar Bill. Amen. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, with a mustache, Dollar Bill, tons of chest hair. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> so. So how does, how does Steve Spurrier find a kid near Ottawa? Um, you know, this was back, do you remember like when you were getting recruited, like using the video that your mom shot at your high school games and like, and then like dubbing it onto like an awful VHS and having to like put it in the mail and like, it might get there in like three weeks. My, I had, I had ZZ Top in the background playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to come up with your own, like you have to dub in your own music. Like what, what, what would the coach like? What's maybe a little bit too aggressive? Yeah, I agree. Guns N' Roses for me, I thought might be too much. I wasn't sure, but it was Weird Al Yankovic. I just went with that, put it in the mail. There was like, we were in a situation in Canada, honestly, where there was like no, there was no American scouts ever coming to our high school games, right? So I had to like, I had to go to Michigan and Penn State and these football camps um, in the summers. Um, and then heading into my junior year, my senior year, um, my dad, who was my coach, basically said, look, we're gonna have to get proactive. We have to start sending tapes out to schools. Um, let's, let's, let's try an experiment. And we just said, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, aim at the top five passing schools in college football and send tapes out to them because we have to set a ceiling. We gotta see like, we don't wanna waste our time and, and money, by the way, putting all these tapes together. So I think back then, like, Spurrier was the, the Gators in 95, 96 with Werfel were like slinging it around. BYU, Lavelle Edwards, like Steve Sarkeesian, those guys were throwing it around. Yeah. Uh, Mariucci was at Cal and they were having a ton of success. So that's kind of where we sort of aimed and sent our tapes. Spurrier got the tape and then I got a phone call the next week from him and he had offered me a scholarship. He never came to Canada. He just watched the tape. Like this is 96 when they're like going to win a national championship. Werbel's going to win the Heisman. Like it was, it was crazy how fast it happened. And the next thing I knew in October, I was taking an official visit on homecoming against LSU. And like, that was it. It was like, it was the quickest recruit. It was so quick how it happened. I had to cancel all my other visits uh, at Ohio state and Nick Saban at Michigan state, because that was to me, Florida was sort of the pinnacle because they were going to win the championship. They were cutting edge and throwing the ball. They had Danny Werfel. Spurrier was a, was a great QB mind, and that's, that's kind of how that happened. Jesse, what about, I mean, when you were at Florida, you were splitting time with Doug Johnson and Rex. How was that? Was that awkward? Was that challenging? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was unique, definitely, because I think that was kind of, you know, that was really the first time. I, I, you know, I remember it became a big story. A lot of, just a lot of teams didn't have QBs rotating like that a lot um you know it's funny when i think back to florida we had a lot of talent at the quarterback position uh there was one year where we had four guys that were all going to play in the nfl on the roster at the same time and i think spurrier kind of treated it uh like he treated every other position if if guys are good they get a chance to play it's no different than anything else um i think for me you know the, the good the good thing and the way i tried to approach it was you know i wasn't a real streaky i wasn't a real streaky player so i didn't have to necessarily get into a rhythm um, I was fine coming in and out and, and sort of just trying to go in and operate. Uh, the game plan was the exact same for everybody. That was the other thing. It wasn't like one guy had one set of plays and then another guy had another set. Um, so it was, it was crazy. I mean, we, we did it uh, in, we played Tennessee in 98 and Doug and I rotated every snap. Uh, the next game against Kentucky, we rotated every series. Uh, there were games against Alabama where Doug and I rotated each quarter. And so there was really never a rhyme or reason to it. It was just, you know, how coach wanted to go, go about it. And, you know, 
fortunately for us, we still were lucky. We won a lot of games um, doing it. And so, you know, it was, it was definitely unique, that's for sure. But, um, you know, it was, it was just sort of coach's mentality, I, I think, based on, based on how he wanted to, uh, how he wanted to game plan. You're obviously very involved in college football now. How do you think that scenario would work in the world of opting out and the portal and transferring? People, you know, one guy has a good game ahead of him and people are already looking around these days. It's like there's no – Crazy. I yeah, mean, it's, it's like, yeah, you know, it's so true. Like, I, I think I was, I was so much more old school, like, in the way I thought about it when I played. Like, you know, there were times where you'd say, hey, you know, is it worth maybe transferring to another school and just being the guy? Uh, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, I talked to my parents about it and they'd say, hey, listen, you got to finish what you started. You went down there, you went to Gainesville, you knew it wasn't going to be easy. They've got a lot of good players. See this thing through, good things will, will, will happen. So that was kind of my, my, my mindset of it. But, you know, it's so funny. You're right. Like kids today, I mean, there's kids that transfer three, four, five times. Uh, they're, they're, they're transferring in high school now. They, right. they go to IMG Academy in Florida and then they go somewhere else and then they, they, they commit and decommit and then recommit and decommit and then go to this school and then transfer within a year. Um, it, it's just, it's the reality. It's the landscape now, but, but I don't know how you feel about it. To me, it's just so different than, than how it was back in the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. I'm a big fan of paying your dues and you know, Hey, you're red shirt, you're a backup, you get a little action. And then, you know, then you, by the time you're a red shirt junior, you're, you know, you're, you're the guy. I mean, in a perfect world, that's the way it used to be. Now, if people aren't starting by the freshman year, they're getting, you know, they're getting their bags packed and they're out of town. I think there's, it's really hard on the coaches, especially. I mean, you recruit a guy, you work so hard to get him here, and then, you know, he's already looking around and some other coaches in his ear saying, come here, come here. Yeah, sure. it, it, you're right. It's like, you know, it used to be you just had to earn it, wait right. your turn. Uh, and and it, it also makes me wonder, like, I don't know how many coaches out there today are promising kids playing time early. Like, to get that kid you're talking about, um, what you may, the deals that you have to make in terms of, hey, if you come here, I promise we'll get you on the field early. And then, you're, like, like you say, things don't necessarily work out. Guy gets hurt. Other guy comes in, plays well. And now the kid's feelings are hurt. Parents are upset. He wants to leave. It's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole bunch of headaches, I think. And I think it's also interesting, I'm sure you did when you were there looking around. I, know I was talking to Peyton about why he went to Tennessee. He's like, well, I was looking at other schools, look at Florida State. They just signed the number one guy. Florida signs a great guy. You, know, you kind of do a little bit, golly, I'm not sure how I would stack up in the depth chart. That's all out the window because people move. You could go and, you know, you can't even weigh that anymore because everybody's, you know, jumping ship. It's just a, it's an odd time. But either way, it worked out. You persevering in Florida worked out. You wind up being a fourth round draft choice by the Giants. And I'm just curious, being the second Canadian to start a football game, do all Canadians have the same body, just with you and Rippon? I mean, I got the same. I've seen you yeah, both. Yeah, I, I, I would say Mark Rippon and I probably have a good, I, I want to say a six pack. I also don't want to say a two pack. You know, it, it's, some, you know it's somewhere between a one and a half to a two pack. There's a lot of Labatt Blue in, in high school in Canada yeah. growing up. Although I don't think Mark played high school in Canada. I think he went to the States and got his training, which probably explains why he had the NFL career he had. But yeah, you know, I'd say we're all, you know, we have a lot of facial hair. By the time we get there, we usually grow a good mullet. And most importantly, uh, Mark and I could do great playoff beards. Really? Which is, you know, if you think about it in, in the NHL, I mean, that, that's just a rite of passage. I mean, when, when it comes to postseason, uh, you got to be ready. Now, I wish I could tell you I played in a lot of postseasons in the NFL, which I didn't. The only one I did was back in 2002. But I will say, the hockey mullet and the playoff beard, that was in full effect. With Caesars Sportsbook and Casino, every bet earns with Caesars Rewards. That means whether you win or lose, you're always earning towards perks like free stays at iconic Caesars properties, game tickets, dining, and more. And if you haven't started yet, here's a reminder. Your first bet is on Caesars, up to $1,250. Download the app with promo code OMAHAFULL and place your first bet. If you win, congrats. If you don't, you'll get it back as a free bet. I think it's pretty interesting. This is such a pivotal part of your life right here. Getting drafted by the Giants could be maybe the biggest catalyst for your growth as a, uh, as a TV personality. I'm just curious, if you were a, got drafted by the Lions, 
and we're a backup there, do you think you get the opportunities that came your way with The Bachelor? And we're going to get into that, but I'm just curious if that was a fertile ground for for growth in other areas. Yeah, great question. I thought about that. I I, I don't know, but I, I find it hard to believe. I almost got drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs twice before the Giants picked me. Um, and oftentimes I wonder uh, what would have happened. But I got super lucky getting getting drafted to this media market where we had a, you know we had a huge media presence in our locker room at all times, tons of personalities in our locker room, a lot of guys that ended up going on being on TV. Um, from those Giants teams. And, um, I, you know, more than that, too, I, I just think this city, I was able to sort of tap into a lot of my passions now with food, like coming to New York City and getting to eat at all these great restaurants. I think that was one thing that sort of sparked my, my passion about food. And then, you know, unbeknownst to me, years later, we start hosting shows on the Food Network. So, yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's funny. College is something we, can, we have control over. You can right. pick where you want to go. The NFL draft, you have zero control over. Unless you're Unless, Eli. Unless you're Eli. Right. Correct. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm sure your food expertise as the backup quarterback of the Green Bay Packers would probably be a little bit different. You'd just be eating cheese curds all day. It's probably not as glamorous on the uh, Baking Network. Now, let's talk about The Bachelor. How did this come about? Uh, agent called, uh, I, think for, I think that was season four or five. This is 2004. I think they wanted an athlete to do it. So I think they had kind of been looking at athletes in different sports and they, and then a agent called me. He's like, Hey dude, they, they want to fly you out. They want to talk to you about doing this. I was 24 at the time. Would you consider doing it? Yeah. It sounds like a great, it sounds like a really cool opportunity. I'll give it a shot. You know, go out, talk to them, see what it's all about. And, um, and that's essentially how it got started. The funny thing is, is, you know, this is 2004. We're like a four and 12 team. And Jim Fossil is our coach, and he's a real players coach. And obviously, I have to run this by Coach Fossil. And so we're out of practice one day in the bubble. It's late in the season, and I'm kind of telling him, hey, just heads up. You know, this opportunity has come along. I just, you know, I have to tell you guys. And he looks at me, and he's like, you absolutely have to do this. <laughs> and I was really? Like, That's so, yeah, I was like, that is so great. All right, I feel so much better about this. Wasn't sure how this was going to go over. Show's going to start shooting in, like, early February, late January, so there's time. But, but – but good to know. Thank you. Fast forward. Fossil gets fired. I'm in the car going to Newark airport to get on the plane to go start filming. Agent calls and says, you just hired Tom Coughlin and you oh. have to call him and you have to tell him what you're doing. <laughs> that, that's a, that's oh a tough call. God. I mean, that was a tough knows call. Tom Coughlin. He's just a no nonsense, all business guy. I, <laughs> I know. I mean, that would, I would not be a phone call I want to make. It was not, yeah. I, I, I didn't want to. I made the call. Coach ended up being great about it. Uh, all he cared was if I was going to be, be back in time for, like, March off-season workouts, which, of course, I was. And then randomly, fast forward, you know, the show's airing. We're in, like, April or May, and we're out in the stadium having a practice, and he's walking through the stretch lines, and he's, like, <laughs> coughing, like, militant, like, going through the line. He looks over at Tiki. He's like, remember, Tiki, or points of pressure on that ball now. Got to hold on to it. No turnovers. Eli, Eli, check downs are big, okay? If you don't get it, let's go check down. We'll play the next play. Jesse, you picked Jessica? <laughs> Come on. Seriously. Yeah. yeah, and we're dying. Like We're, we're hanging. We're, we're all, like, we're, all, we're doing, like, a laying down quad stretch. And we're, like, all literally laughing, rolling over. Because the last person in the world that I thought would ever watch that, Tom Coughlin. And and. He, and in credit to coach, he probably didn't see it. I'm sure maybe his daughter or his wife or someone was like, he, he kept Jessica. She's, yeah. in, she's, in, she's in the final eight. And it then, was probably you know, Strahan that put him up to it or someone. I mean, someone probably, had yeah. Made, made Sean O'Hara or someone. Yeah. Now, I remember um, this is probably three or four years after The Bachelor. You're down in New Orleans covering the Sugar Bowl or something, and you and I go to Galatoire's, which is a place to be on a Friday at lunch, very festive. Um, and I got a couple of buddies and we went in there and I mean, it is, it was like secretary day or something. There were a lot of just women there eating lunch, drinking, having fun. And you and I are just having a, you know, a bloody Mary and a little piece of fish. But I swear it was like the, when the, the whispers got out, it's like bachelor Jesse. And here we are. We took, we took a hundred pictures with, you know, 
these people coming over, sitting on our lap. What I'm going, I'm getting ready to get divorced here within, you know, before, <laughs> before I've even had the soup at Galatoire's. And then so I was going, this is amazing. It was amazing what the, the notoriety that brought that came your way. Yeah, it, it was great. Well, the best part of it, I think we got like three, three free bottles of champagne, which really was yes. all I was in for. So that was, that was <laughs> outstanding. I think being with you and, and Ro, I think your buddy Rosie was there and it was just, right. we, we, had a, we had a good setup. We had a lot of personality at our table, which in Galatoire's yes. on that day is, is helpful. But yes. yeah, listen, I mean, I, I'd be the first, I'll be the first to admit it. Um, I was naive, I think, doing The Bachelor. Uh, the show had just started, reality TV had just started. There was like, uh, uh, oh God, what was that MTV? It was like real, real world yeah, or something. Real world, you go to the house, everybody lives in the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there weren't that many shows. Athletes hadn't yet started doing reality TV. Now all athletes do it. But um, at the time, I didn't know how big it was gonna be. And I wish I could sit here and be like, I knew exactly what I was doing. I did the show knowing when I was done football, I'd get on TV. It would help my career because it put me in front of a completely different demographic. I had no foresight into that. I literally just did the show because I thought it would be fun. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, and I just thought it'd be a cool experience. And then I would get back to playing football and, and get back to, uh, to, to normal. But looking back at it, I am so glad I did it because it did end up opening a lot of opportunities and got us free wine at uh, Galatoire's. Yeah, I'm always curious. Like I was looking the other day where Chase Daniel, who's been a backup for multiple years now he's i think he's started seven games i think he's thrown 11 touchdowns he's made 40 million dollars being a backup i'm just wondering if he thinks god i should have gone into broadcasting like jesse and not you know cut this thing short did you ever think that maybe you were going to be a backup you know, you know just be a guy who played eight nine ten years and then figure it out later on yeah i mean I, my whole plan of course was to play 15 years in the nfl and just have that type of career i talked to troy aikman and jason garrett and some other guys that had that had started playing quarterback and then got into tv a little bit and then sort of you know about hey when should you leave uh in 2007 when i signed with espn i sort of i came to that kind of that impasse that fork in the road where i you know i was offered a job you know i called some nfl games for fox at the end of the 2006 season i got offered by fox and espn one to one for pro one for college and i was still i was playing in, in the cfl at the time uh, with montreal and, and i was i was having so much fun and i thought you know do i really want to walk away from the game now the only thing i've ever wanted to do since i was seven years old um and my, my thought was i'll do tv for a year see if i like it if i hate it i'm still young enough i can go back and keep playing football the truth is though it's funny you know, the advice I was getting from everybody was just play as long as you can. TV will always be there. But, but the reality for us as players, I think, is that every year, Brett Favre is going to retire. Drew Brees is soon going to retire. And if <laughs> Drew Brees says, you know what, I want to do TV, I would kind of like a seat. Guess, guess who's going to get the seat? Yeah. It's Drew Brees. Oh, right. So, so in, in a lot of ways, like there's a Heisman Trophy winner that's going to retire every year. And so – you know, there are limited amount of seats. And I just felt like, hey, you know, I should really try to capitalize on this, this opportunity, give it an honest shot. Worked at ESPN, did that for a year, loved it. Because I still felt, I still felt um, attached to the game, uh, the game that I love. It was great. And then really the rest is history. It's crazy. It's been 14 years at ESPN now. The time is, it's flown. And you've worked with some legends, obviously, with Brent Musburger, John Saunders, another uh, Canadian. I mean, you, you've right. been in some broadcast, some big games. Do you like doing the games or do you like being in the, in the studio more? Yeah, I, I like both. The, the games are great because you can sort of study the teams throughout the week and then be there in the game. You have the energy in the stadium and you're diving into these two teams and the schemes and everything for three and a half hours. Uh, I also love the studio though, because you really kind of get to kind of treetop and touch really the national landscape. And our, our Saturdays are epic. I mean, at, up in Bristol, uh, I mean, games start at noon and we're not off the air till 2.30 in the morning. I mean, you, you're just going 14 and a half hours. You watch ball all day. I mean, you have to be a footballaholic, but if you are, it, it's, it's great. So I sort of love, I sort of love both. And then how does that compare to an average day filming in The Bachelor? How many days, how many hours a week, I mean, how many hours a day were you working there? I mean, making out for seven hours, basically, I mean, you can take it out of it. You, you got to like, you, you know, at some point you need a water break. Yeah, you need a bowl of chili or something just to try to, try to you know, get, get through it. Bachelor, those were long days as well. But I'd say by like the sixth vodka soda, you're feeling pretty good. Like you were like, at that point, you didn't, you didn't have a, a concept. 
you can they can they let you have a little courage along the way yeah it's it was it, I don't know how it is today but back on season four or five it was I think it was encouraged you know get get, get a little get a little courage and is that there's some awkward moments I assume and they probably put you in some kind of peculiar you're like in a hot tub or a, they're trying to and you got some camera in your face and they're like all right start talking and you kind of nah, just I mean, share that, your feelings. That wasn't, that wasn't so weird because Eli and I used to just used to have hot tub parties and we'd film <laughs> ourselves. So it's like, that was, that was normal. It was I more like, it, 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 yeah, I mean, we, you know, we had the whole, like the whole building in Hoboken and it was great. No, it's like, yeah, I mean, it was it weird. Yeah, it was weird. Um, and this is like, it, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, you never go on a date with, with 10 people and, and act like it's, it's cool riding an elephant. It's, that's true. Yeah, I mean, maybe you do. I don't know. Like I, people like that would be, you know, I've, that wasn't, I've ridden, you know. A, I've ridden a camel before. That's the only thing I've ever done. It was, it was a, as was a payday a, tuition. A I had to do it. Oh. It was, it, it didn't, it, I thought it was going to lead to a date, but I got dumped before I even got off that camel. So it worked out right. not quite like I wanted to. You got the camel ride. And so that pivots into football. Now, now it, they're, there are women across the country, I guess men as well, who are food crazy folks who don't even know you played a down of football or broadcast a, a single right. football game that know you for cooking and baking. Baking, that's it. Now, I <clears throat> was working on a little bunt cake recipe of mine earlier. I'll, I'll send it to you and see whether you think it matches up because I think I've got the potential to be on one of your baking shows. I'll pass that by Deb Goldman. I'll see what he says. He's pretty tough. He's critical. Because um, I, I know you've been in New Orleans and called me and said, I'm doing here, doing, you know, championship baking, but it's, it's long hours. We shoot down there. It's, it's awesome. We're, we're in LA and New, New Orleans has become like a, like a food network mecca for a ton of their competition shows. People don't know that. I get super stoked every time we do. Uh, I get to see you guys. I get to come down and eat well. We're there for like two and a half, three weeks at times. And the shows are really long. It, it's, it's, you know, you kind of, you're at studio at 7 a.m. You might, you might wrap at 6, 6 p.m. You're just eating, you're hosting, you're laughing, you're eating. Uh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, there's, there's nothing like just like stuffing your face with sugar for about 13 hours and then going to Emeralds and popping like three G's and calories and butter. You and I have had lunch before and I noticed back in the day, this is years ago, you always took a picture of something coming out because you had a blog or you were, you were, I mean, you're a, you're a real foodie. You think you could yeah. put on, you could put on a hundred pounds easily if you got lazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, makeup covers about 20, 20 of it. My beard, <laughs> the other 20, you wouldn't really be able to tell. Yeah, dude, I love it, man. I love it. I, I've been lucky. Like I've traveled around the world and I, and I, and I love these great food cities. New Orleans is, is maybe my favorite. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, it, 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 it's it's something I get really excited about. And I think that's the thing that, that hopefully people at home get. Like, I guess if football fans see me on ESPN, they, they, they put it together. They go, okay, he played college, he played in the NFL, he loves football. You know, uh, he's credible to, to, you know, to an extent, you know, with respect to what he's saying. With food, you know, I'm not a chef. I can't bake or cook anything. Um, but I love it and I'm passionate about it. And, and my excitement, I think, comes out. Um, and I think hopefully that's what people at home, what comes across to people at home for that. It's not necessarily being an expert or pro at it. It's just being legitimately interested. And I think that's, that, that, that's what I have so much fun. Um, that's why I have so much fun on the show. And Jesse, now you are, uh, your single life is over. You're engaged. I think it's, I'm impressed that you are engaged with someone who's making homemade soup. I knew, I mean, I knew she would have to have some talents, uh, in the kitchen. She, uh, tell me about, the fiance and you know you've yeah. been a single guy I'm, I'm thrilled to know you're becoming a family man here thank god because otherwise we'd be having soup i'd be in like a, a euro euro <laughs> brunch right now with house music in the background it'd be hard to like hear you and like i'd be getting my uh it'd be, it'd be like some fancy french cold soup consomme of something uh, emily's been amazing i met emily emily's from brazil i met emily in a boxing class here in the city um over three years ago and uh yeah it's you know she's she i'm very lucky she's an awesome cook loves food uh like me loves to travel loves eating uh she does a way better job you know she can eat whatever she wants and look she looks fantastic i'm like in the gym i'm on the peloton sweating all over myself 
but she's she's amazing. And and what's cool about this is I told her I was like, hey, my buddy's having me on his podcast. Um, I need a soup. And she was like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, no, it's called listen, it's called soup with coop. And you have to have this. You have to have a soup. So can we make so? What do you think? And she's like, well, let me. Uh, there, there's this famous kind of like Brazilian stew. It's called feijoada. And she was thinking about making that. And I said, you know, you could do that. I was like, or, and she, she, to her credit, she went on like New York times and she found this Texas chili recipe. And, that, and this is kind of what she came up with. How lucky am I? Like she was, she was ready. She knew. I think, I think you picked the right girl, my friend. I picked a winner. This is the last part of the show. We taste the soup and you give it a rating between one and 1000. So be careful. If you want wedding bells to actually happen, you might be careful with uh... yeah. I'll give this a solid 836. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's a little salty, and that's actually my fault. When she was really? making it, she was like, what do you think, too salty? And I was like, it needs a little bit more. She put some more in, a little too salty. Uh, my jalapeno idea, I think, came back to bite me. So <clears throat> that's a very, as I'm like joking, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very Canadian answer for you because I gave her a lot of credit and essentially docked the points because of me. That's that's what a husband does, you know. It, I'm learning. Uh, you're an unselfish guy. You're, you're you're on your way to greatness, my friend. I cannot thank you enough for joining me on Soup and Coop, Jess. Always a pleasure to hang out with you, and uh, I look forward to bumping into you soon, my friend. You got it, brother. We'll see you down in New Orleans soon. Thanks for having me on, man. My pleasure. Really fun. Cheers, brother.